Look at this. This is a circle. All points are equal distance from the center, creating a constant curve. This is not a square, an enclosed object that has four equal sides at four equal angles. Um, you're just not considering that a circle has a property of a squared. So really, it is a square and a circle. No. Look at the definition of circle and look at the definition of square. A circle cannot be a square. Again, yes. It does look like a circle and meets the definition of a circle, but you're overlooking that the circle has the squared property. Thus, while it is a circle, it is also a square. If it didn't have the squared property, I could see your point, but it does have the squared property. What's the squared property? It's a property that if an object has it, then the object is a square. But it's not a square. Yes, it is. It has a squared property. This is easy stuff. I don't understand why you don't understand this. It seems to me that you're just begging the question and committing the definist fallacy at the same time in order to uphold this arbitrary standard that's contradictory and against the definitions. You're just not as philosophical as me, so you don't understand. Yeah, I think we're done here. Read that we're bringing uh, about Calvinism in general are based upon certain aspects of what Calvin himself taught or what some of the leading Calvinists like John Piper uh, teach because they are the most influential uh, in uh, our world today with regard to Calvinism. And so when we're asking these points or these questions, remember that we're not necessarily saying that all Calvinists agree with each other on all these different points. We're also not saying necessarily that Calvinists would openly affirm fatalism, for example, on the point we're going to talk about today. Um, but instead, what we're saying is if the claims of Calvinism are true, could you call Calvinist fatalist? And so point number four in the uh, 12 myths about Calvinism, this article from Michael Patton is dealing with fatalism. Let's look at it firsthand. It says this, Cal Calvinism is not belief in fatalism. A fatalistic worldview is one in which all things are left to fate, chance, and uh, a series of causes and effects that no intelligent guide or ultimate cause. Calvinism believes that God, not fate, is in control, though Calvinists differ about how meticulous this control is. And so he's just affirming there what I just said, is that Calvinism is not a monolithic group. They don't all agree with each other. Uh, John Calvin and I would say John Piper both believed in a complete deterministic, meticulous control of every thought, action, and deed. Um, and, and therefore, to say that that's what Calvinists teach and believe is not misrepresenting and it's not a myth. Um, to say that Calvinists believe in theistic determinism or that God meticulously controls every thought, action, and deed of every single dust mite, every molecule, every thought, action, and deed of every moral being um, is all meticulously, divinely brought about by God for God's glory. We've read quote after quote already um, affirming that that is base level Calvinism, what John Calvin, Piper, and other leading Calvinists teach and continually to promote. And so it's not a myth to say that that's true of Calvinism. Now, is that considered fatalism? Um, it depends on, you know, obviously, just like any other thing, you know, it depends on how you define the word. If you just bring up a basic definition of fatalism from um, Webster's, it says this, it's a doctrine that, that events are fixed in advance so that human beings are powerless to change them. Okay. So if you believe in theistic determinism, then by that definition, you would also be uh, affirming a form of at least theistic fatalism, that God, in other words, uh, he's the one who fixes all of these events, ev uh, events in advance, and that human beings are powerless to change them. In other words, we have no power, contra causal uh, uh, ability, to change or to choose or to act differently than what God has fixed by his eternal decree. And so if you're defining fatalism in the most basic common way that it's understood by most people, um, when they hear the word fatalism, then I think you can, by this definition, accuse Calvinists um, like John Calvin, like John Piper of being fatalistic. Um, now, John Piper, interestingly enough, was asked this question in a, uh, a discourse at a prison. In fact, he was at a prison given this, uh, this talk. And you can hear the question for yourself. It's about fatalism and listen to his answer. Dr. Piper, as a Reformed theologian, when you emphasize the sovereignty of God, how do you keep out of the trap of fatalism, especially in your preaching, your practice, and your prayer? How do I, as a Reformed theologian, 
avoid fatalism. I mean, I, let's see if we can put a definition on fatalism. Fatalism, I take, would mean um, que sera, sera. If God wills everything, then what will be will be, and uh, do what you want to do, or no point in praying, no point in evangelizing. You can't have any influence on the future or whatever. Is that roughly what fatalism would mean to you, or do you want to define it more closely? Um, not so much as the looseness of it, but the logic when we emphasize the sovereignty of God is easy when you're following the five points of Calvin to, to go into that, that, well, what's going to be is going to be. We have the language of it when we discussed the predestination, when we discussed earlier, you quoted the scripture. They weren't of us, so they, they went out from us. So it would have never made any difference how much preaching they heard, how much witnessing. That doesn't resolve – that doesn't absolve us from our responsibility, but – Needless to say, we, we come into this idea of what's going to be is what's going to be. How do you stay out of okay. that? The, the way I stay out of that is by being more biblical than reformed. That is, I don't draw inferences from, from theological, logical suppositions or assumptions. I go to my Bible and I look out, I, I look for verses and sentences and paragraphs that tell me the implications of God's sovereignty. They tell me. I don't think it up. Like if you tell me, well, if God predestines everybody, there's no point in praying. Or if God predestines, there's no point in evangelizing. I say, well, you can be that logical if you want. I'm being biblical. Okay, so <laughs> I, I think he probably would want to take that back and re, uh, rephrase it if he had a chance. I know sometimes when you're speaking in public, you say things that you aren't real careful about saying. Um, I'd rather be logical than biblical. What you, that seems to be implying is that the Bible is not logical. And, that, and for us as apologists, we all go, oh, no, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't. Uh, but pastors can say those kinds of things sometimes. And we as apologists and others, don't, oh, no, don't. Because if you say something's not logical um, or if you say something contradictory, you have falsified it. You have co you have proven it to be false, um, logically speaking. And uh, and I don't think that we as Christians should uh, step into that category of thinking that way. Or And I know any reformers would be, would be aghast at saying, hey, I'd rather be biblical than reformed. Um, that, that seems to imply that uh, <laughs> Reformed theology is not biblical, um, which, again, those of us who don't affirm uh, Calvinism might be okay with that, but I'm sure those who do affirm Calvinism wouldn't want it put that way. And so maybe he wasn't just, he wasn't being real careful. Here's the argument that I want to make on this point. I think what Calvinists have done is they're affirming the tenets that underlie fatalism, while at the same time denying that we should behave or act as if those tenets are truly in play. Let me say that again. Here's my argument. I, I agree Michael Patton is saying Calvinists don't affirm that you should be fatalistic in the way you act, okay? But at the same time, Calvinists are affirming true the tenets which underlie fatalism, the idea of fatalism, that all things are set, they are fixed in such a way that we as uh, human beings cannot affect um, the future or we cannot change those things that have been eternally decreed. They are set in stone. Um, and because they're set in stone, however, we shouldn't behave or act as if that is true. So you should act and behave as if you are affecting the future while believing that you don't, in a sense, okay? So you, in other words, you have to, as Piper's kind of arguing here, he's kind of, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta behave like the tomorrow depends upon you while believing and holding to a, a theistic deterministic worldview that all things are fated by a divine being, i.e. God through um, a sovereign quote unquote sovereign decree. And that's where these kinds of tensions uh, grow from. Okay. And this, this kind of difficulty grows from these issues. Um, now, here, here's part of the problem with this. It, it does get into philosophy, as, as Piper mentioned here. And because it is so philosophical, sometimes we miss some major points here, and we miss looking at what the Bible says on these particular issues. And so on that point, I do agree with Piper. I think we need to go to the Bible, not to our philosophy. Now, uh, saying that, <laughs> even as you read Scripture— you're going to be bringing some philosophical presuppositions. So I'm. Look at this. This is a circle. All points are equal distance from the center, creating a constant curve. This is not a square, an enclosed object that has four equal sides at four equal angles. Um, you're just not considering that a circle has a property of a squared. So really, it is a square and a circle. No. 
Look at the definition of circle and look at the definition of square. A circle cannot be a square. Again, yes, it does look like a circle and meets the definition of a circle, but you're overlooking that the circle has the squared property. Thus, while it is a circle, it is also a square. If it didn't have the squared property, I could see your point, but it does have the squared property. What's the squared property? It's a property that if an object has it, then the object is a square. But it's not a square. Yes, it is. It has a squared property. This is easy stuff. I don't understand why you don't understand this. It seems to me that you're just begging the question and committing the definist fallacy at the same time in order to uphold this arbitrary standard that's contradictory and against the definitions. You're just not as philosophical as me, so you don't understand. Yeah, I think we're done here. <laughs>